I changed around my talk. You shouldn't do this, but I changed around my talk last night, and it was because I heard so much about salts yesterday. I didn't think we needed to keep talking about salts again, so my talk's going to be more, much more about molecules and reactions than it is about salts and, and some other things. And so I, I'm guessing that some of you, particularly the young woman in the back who I can no longer see because of that darn light, but uh, some of you don't know much about what we do. So I thought I would just uh, give you a little bit of advertisement in the beginning here and say that, that in our laboratory, we have three general areas of work. And one's planetary science, is planetary science, solar system chemistry we have an interest in. Uh, interstellar chemistry is about maybe a quarter of our time. And then astrobiology is maybe the other quarter. It runs something like that. We look at formation, destruction of molecules, applied to starting with Mars and going outward. Mars and a little bit on Jupiter's atmosphere, and then some about uh, Titan and the atmosphere of Titan. And then, of course, in between Jupiter's atmosphere and Titan, we got a little Europa there, don't we? And then you've got Kuiper Belt objects and, and Oort cloud objects, if you go in farther out, and then interstellar chemistry. So formation, destruction of molecules in those environments. Reactions, we're very interested in reactions. It's one thing to see something, you know, then you want to identify it, then you want the reactions, then you want the mechanisms. Me Mechanisms are hard, and so we do mechanisms when we can, and so do other people. Another part of our work involves uh, generating reference measurements, reference measurements for uh, things like the Hubble Space Telescope, James Webb Space Telescope, ISO, Spitzer, and so forth. These are much more probably interstellar than planetary, but some planetary too. Reference spectra, physical properties like densities, uh, vapor pressures, uh, energies, enthalpy of sublimation. We do band strengths. We do some optical constants. Can you hear me through this thing? Okay, optical constants. Uh, we do much more lately, the last few years, in the mid, the, the real mid infrared, as opposed to the far infrared or the the near. The and some planetary people want us to do more near, and we've got people who are associated with Cassini at Goddard who talk to us about doing more far. And so we uh, satisfy neither group by going in the mid-infrared. And we eventually, we know that we can scale out to these other regions, but it's hard work. And I will tell you, I don't uh, plan to talk about this here. Where's the darn laser here, Tracy? This thing? Yeah. This one. And I will tell you that this is uh, the, the people who do this sort of work. Boy, you have my admiration uh, more now than ever because I've done, how do I get rid of this thing? There. I've, I've done more of this in the last uh, four or five years than I ever thought I would. I never thought NASA would or somebody would pay me to do this sort of thing, but there's a big need for this, as multiple people have said here today. It's amazing what's never been measured. This stuff here, same sort of thing. It's hard work. It's really tough stuff. There are some days when I, uh, you know, I, I wish I'd never seen an optical constant and just want to go off and, and, and do some other things, but it's... Uh, it's, it's not easy to do this, and anybody who does this has my, uh, my admiration here. So let's go on. Uh, these are tourist pictures. This doesn't mean anything to you. This could be something at San Antonio at Southwest Research or someplace. But believe me, this is really at the Goddard Space Flight Center, these things. We have two laboratories, one radiation lab, a non-radiation lab. The uh, radiation lab, you can see there's an old-style Van de Graaff accelerator here. We have infrared spectrometers, vacuum chambers, UHV. Uh, energy source electron gun down here. This is actually the same thing as this, but I wasn't going to tell you that, but I just did. And this is a, di a different uh, different view. And for the young woman who asked about the equipment up here, our pendulum in our laboratory swings back and forth. Some years we have uh, lots of people and not enough equipment, and we're bumping into each other and elbowing each other to get access to the, the, uh, the computers and spectrometers. Right now we're equipment rich. We have five stations set up and only three civil servants. So why build your own equipment when you can come visit us and do something? So right now we, we're, uh, we're equipment rich. We're uh, very, very lucky, I suppose, but I don't know what to say. With a lot of equipment, you've got to keep up stuff. You can't just buy a bunch of automobiles and put them in the garage and hope they're all going to work. You know, so the same thing on equipment here. I, I wish I had a picture of what's going on at the end of this uh, beam line here. This is an old accelerator. It goes back to the days in Nikita Khrushchev. The beam line comes down. He was a premier of Russia. You know, some of you remember that. And, okay, go to an electromagnet. And then the beam, our beam we've been using for a long time is protons. comes down through here. And on the end of the line is where our Europa chamber is. It's what we call the dirty chamber. The reason it's dirty, it's actually not dirty, it's very clean, but the reason we call it dirty is because Europa has so many things going on, you know, sulfuric acid and ozone and peroxide, and these are things normally you wouldn't want to put into a vacuum system if you could help it, but that's the way Europa is, and that's what you got to do. So they actually, the, the Europa chamber sits on the end of this thing, and if you visit us one day, we'll show you all this. We're very open about this. If you, uh, if you want to come visit us, please let us know ahead of time. This is a little problem sometimes getting people in, but it's usually not difficult. 
Now, this is a cartoon I've shown a lot of times, block diagram. It illustrates the basic idea behind our radiation experiments. You start out with a vacuum chamber. The vacuum chamber we use does not have holes in it. I had a high school student ask me that one time. The, the vacuum chamber is the, the dash blue lines here. You have a, you have a, a slab here. It's about the size of a, a quarter, about the size of a, a one euro coin. This, uh, this thing right here, looking at it edgewise here. We connect this up to a cryostat, a cooler, a refrigeration system. It runs you about 20,000 or so, depending on what you want to, how many goodies you want to get with it. We cool this thing down inside a vacuum chamber, and then we allow it to come in water plus whatever molecule we want to look at. And sometimes we want to look at just water. Sometimes it's water plus CO2 or whatever Ben showed a minute ago, water and acetylene or something or other. Sometimes it's just acetylene. That's a messy experiment. And uh, it's like, uh, what do you say? It's like a uh, cold can of Pepsi on a hot Houston day. You know, the, the water vapor in the air, the condensation sticks onto the metal surface just like condensation will stick on the outside of that Pepsi can. And when the, uh, the, the material grows here, we call that an ice. And so to the, the people who study glaciers, I don't know, Don Blankenship or somebody, people who do glaciers, that we, we look at ices here just really thin. But to the surface science people, we're out of this world. We, you know, the surface science people looking down at nanometers or something or other, and we're, we're, we're somewhere between nanometers and glaciers. We're usually, usually micrometers to, to millimeters. And they, again, there's some reasons for that I can go into later. Uh, there's a, a arrow up here. That doesn't mean we spin the experiment. What that means is we can rotate this thing so it's facing that way. I hate to do this. Or this way. We can rotate at any angle, actually. We, we rotate the, uh, the sample so it faces the IR source. We can bounce an infrared beam off and record a spectrum. When we're happy with the sample, our, our peaks are going to go up for this talk. When we're happy, we rotate the sample 180 degrees to the opposite direction, and it faces the proton beam, and we get our radiation dose. And after doing a few hundred or, I don't know, maybe a thousand times doing this thing over 30 years, you know, we have a pretty good idea what doses we want to look at. You know, we know how long to keep the beam on the sample and things like that. That turns out not to be a problem. Uh, the, the other details here, you know, temperature range, uh, 300. I don't know what Mars is now. 240 is the highest for Mars. I don't know what Mars is the highest. And so we, we never have to go up this high. So we go, uh, the temperature is from about 240, 230, something like that, on down to about 10, maybe 8 or 9K. That's interstellar stuff. And pressures, a lot of times 10 to minus 8. We have a UV, several UV systems do this. We have UHV, two UHV systems, one under construction. And usually UHV is just overkill. It's just usually not necessary. Even 10K is overkill for, for if you're doing Europa. What's the lowest on Europa? 80K or something like that. So 10K is just overkill. And that's the basic idea. Uh, there's some advantages of this sort of setup here. The reflection sometimes causes problems. You've got to do some calibrations to, to uh, get around that. But the, the dose measurement is very direct. We measure the, the radiation as it goes through the sample. So we can measure an electrical current. We get a very good dose measurement. We get a good temperature measurement up here. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's not, really a, not really a problem. But a third thing, and I'm not sure I've heard anybody say this, is that this is an in situ measurement. You know, we don't have to go and, and pull the sample out somewhere, you know, knock it out or dissolve it or something like that. We, we can actually analyze for a few things in the sample itself. And again, there's pros and cons to, to do that. We can't, you know, we can't identify some big giant honking molecule like chlorophyll or naphthalene or, you know, some big giant. We could, we could never do that. It's just too complicated. But the smaller sorts of molecules that are usually associated have been uh, reported in most of the, most of the time reported for Europa. We can, we can identify a lot of those things. It takes a little bit of work. The things on the bottom are dose measurements, various types, exposure measurements. I gave a talk a few years ago at an astrobiology meeting about how confusing all these measurements were. And I, I don't know if it's a successful talk. It left the audience confused. And so <laughs> in a sense, it was successful. I was trying to make a point how, how you can lie with dose units. And I'm not going to repeat that. It's in one of our papers if you want to, to know how to lie with dose units. What's that? I got five minutes to go? That's impossible. I just started talking. It's only it's only two twelve. I started talking at two. Yeah. Good gosh, I got to. Wow. I got a rapid rapid heartbeat here. <laughs> Cardiac arrest. Anyway, I've barely gotten started. But. So. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the pattern is this. This is what we do. So if you're not familiar with our work, we, you know, we start with the observed molecules and we try to go backwards and try to go forwards. And, and somebody asked one time about the, the realism of the samples. I've forgotten who that was. And it's always a balance between starting out with uh, something fairly simple or something complicated. 
whether simplicity is what you want, you have to sacrifice sometimes realism for simplicity. Okay, so here it is. Here's the inspiration. This is a difficult problem chemically because you've got lots of things going on, and uh, this is uh, something you can you can uh, you know try to study in all its uh, you know complexity, but it's very difficult to put all these things together at one time in a realistic sort of experiment. You've got uh, cosmic radiation, magne mostly magnetospheric radiation coming in. You get implantation materials. You've got some uh, UV from the sun. You can have chemical reactions. You could have sputtering, as uh, you heard a few minutes ago. Uh, lethal dose, you get lethal dose. I've, I've heard different numbers here, but lethal dose, uh, the shortest numbers I've heard are minutes. I've heard people talk about, uh, you know, hour, things like that. It's a very high energy, high radiation environment here. And so what I'm going to do is talk only about uh, two molecules, really. The first one here is water. There are three or four of you I know that know this very well. There are probably 30 of you who do not. So bear with me a minute, you three or four. Uh, this is an old image of a uh, well, sample of uh, water in a cloud chamber. So this is really a gas, and I'm going to pretend it's an ice. And so the way this works is an ion comes into an ice, and an ion creates a track through the ice of ionizations and excitations. You can see the date here, how old this is. The, uh, the, the tracks, that you, things that you see along the side here, these are secondary events caused by electrons that are kicked out of the water molecule by the original projectile. I don't really like that word, project sounds too violent. You know, by the original ion, the incident ion that you have there. The, uh, the thing that's hard to remember is that the chemistry, by and large, is created by the secondary events, the secondary electrons, the electrons that you kick out here, and then their daughters, the secondary electrons that have even lower energies. The initial water molecule that you strike, you know, undergo either ionization directly or excitation and produce a water radical cation and electron. You get a very fast transfer within 10 to the minus 13 seconds or so, one molecular vibration to get an ion molecule reaction, produce hydronium over here. So this is something you can't stop. You can't stop the production of hydronium. It's there. You know, it's just the way it is unless you're, unless you're Harry Potter or something. You, know, you can't stop the, the, uh, the formation of a hydronium ion and hydroxyl ion but left behind. And so the thing that's hard to remember is that the, the average energy of some of these events down at the end of the trail here, the average energy is actually quite low. It's, it's actually on the order of 10 EV or so, which is in the photochemistry range. And for every ion that comes in, you produce thousands and tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of secondary events. So the identity of this original thing up here gets lost. You know, you, you can look at a picture that shows you a cloud chamber photograph of uh, hydrogen coming in versus helium coming in. Unless you have some reference material to compare with, it's, it's very difficult to distinguish between the two. Let me say that again. It's very hard to distinguish the final products of the radiation, the final chemical products. It's very hard to distinguish between, say, a hydrogen ion coming in, an electron, or carbon. That's, that's, it's very hard to do. Just looking at the products. And that's what you look at when you look at Europa. You're looking at the products. What are they? Water or whatever, or the molecules that are there. This is uh, 10 EVs in the realm of photochemistry, vacuum UV photochemistry. The photochemical products that you see from gas phase water aren't the same as from liquid phase water. The chemical mechanisms are not the same. It's been known since the 1960s, long time ago. Since the 1960s, it's been known that you can actually create uh, secondary electrons. You can kick out electrons with uh, energies on the order of 6 or 7 EV from water, condensed phase water, not gas phase water. The ionization energy of water, is, I think, is 12.6 EV. And so this is much below. So the work function or the, the energy needed to create electrons, secondary electrons with liquid and solid water isn't the same as gas phase water. So the products of photochemistry and, and radiation chemistry are actually fairly similar. Not fairly similar. In most cases, they are very, very similar. It's hard, again, to distinguish between the two. So the summary is this. This is the bottom line. These are the sort of things that you make with ionizing radiation. These sorts of things here. You get uh, combinations of these things and make these. Some over here, hydroxide. This is actually a very exciting one here. Hyd hyd the hydride ion has only been identified the last few years. Uh, some oxygen directly. O2 is a secondary product. Occasionally, you hear someone talk about O3. I think someone mentioned O3 yesterday. I don't know. If you go to, if you go to a radiation meeting and radiation chemistry meeting and talk about O3, they'll, uh, I don't know what, slowly back away from you or something. I don't know what. They'll, they'll think that's a little bit odd. But, but with enough energy and enough so forth, you, can, you could actually do it. Okay, so here it is, the, uh, the big discovery. This is the most unsurprising thing I could think about about Europa. The most unsurprising thing was the, the uh, report of peroxide on the surface. Unsurprising does not mean unexciting, though. It's a very exciting discovery. This is one of the best pieces of evidence, maybe the very best, 
for the, 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 the uh, phenomenon of radiolysis on a water surface. This is probably the best example, but it wasn't very surprising. Peroxide had been found in ices back in 1908, I think it was, in Marie Curie's laboratory, in fact, in Paris. This is, uh, I'm going to write 100 K here, reaction, water, radiation, peroxide, and some hydrogen over here at the side. And we, we try to do this experiment in a laboratory. There's a long history behind this. It started in, the, the long history started in 1999. You know, as far as I could tell, the first experiment was one that we tried to do. We tried to take a sample that was at, uh, 10, we started at 10 K. 10 K, we did this experiment. We got a spectrum to look exactly like that. Perfect, wonderful. And then we did the Europa experiment, raised the temperature up to 100 Kelvin, exposed to radiation, <laughs> nothing works. No peroxide at 100 K, <laughs> but yet there it is. And I remember Marla Moore drew a face on this. She made this the mouth, and this the nose, and this the eyes, and it was like you know sticking its tongue out at us, you know, I can make peroxide and you can't, or something like that. So we went back and, and thought through this again, and then gradually, of course, you come to a conclusion Europa is not just water ice, is it? Europa has other things present. And so as soon as we tried peroxide and a few other good electron scavengers, you can make the peroxide and it looks just like this thing up here. Okay, so it's not very hard. You can get a few tenths of a, a mole fraction, a few tenths of a percent. It's uh, not very difficult to do. So this was, I have to say, one of the, uh, the stun stunning, it's a little bit overkill maybe, but one of the surprising results in my career is to, to find that you couldn't make hydrogen peroxide in pure water ice at a detectable amount detectable by infrared at 100K. It's there. It's just that it's hard to see with, uh, with infrared spectroscopy. Okay, so this is one. I'm only going to talk about two or three molecules, and this is one I thought that we ought to go back through because nobody talked about the ways in which this stuff forms. This stuff is hard to make in, in the detectable amount that you see there if you only got pure water ice on the surface of Europa, and I, I don't know if anyone studied the, uh, the distribution of, of peroxide versus the distribution of CO2. I don't know if that's been done. Maybe, maybe it has. I, I'm, I'm not sure. But CO2 actually helps you get the peroxide here. CO2 will actually help jack up the, the abundance that you have. Okay, now I had to pick out another molecule here but between the two. And I, I picked out CO2, and I, I, I'm already thinking about maybe I should have picked out, S, uh, I picked out SO2. Maybe I should have picked out CO2. So the next few minutes is going to be only SO2. Okay, so here's the second paper, 1999, the second big paper, and uh, one of the authors is in this room. SO2, it, uh, nobody would doubt that you, you put SO2 in water, that you're going to get uh, sulfate if you have a little bit of oxidant there, and I just talked to you about an oxidant, hydrogen peroxide. So we didn't have any doubt you could do this over here. This one came up a little bit later. So the radiolysis experiment, this is actually now some real data here some real data from us. This is uh, an experiment. I think this was something like maybe 5 to 1, 10 to 1 ratio up here. You have a spectrum up here. You know, you've got bands here. You can see very distinctly from SO2, some bands for water, and you crank up your radiation source, and what happens is the SO2 band begins to fall down, and you get some other stuff coming up, which you can identify as sulfate. And this takes a lot of work to do the reference spectra, and you've got to have the right temperatures and so forth and so on. But we wrote this up some years ago with Bob Carlson, who came in our laboratory and helped us out with this. And so if I read the papers by Chris Peranicus and, and John Cooper and other people, if I read those correctly, the doses we use here correspond within 100 micrometers to, to only about 15 years on Europa, which I don't think about as very long in geological time scales, and maybe you do, I don't know. Anyway, this was not a problem making a hydrogen pro making a sulfate over here from SO2. You can make hydrates, but we did not find it was possible to make hydrates just by radiation. And so yesterday I was surprised to hear people talking about sulfuric acid hydrates as a radiation product. I, I don't know how you're going to get that. You know that uh, again, time is the somebody mentioned Nuzwal or somebody mentioned time up here. Maybe time is the solution. If you do the irradiation and wait for years and years and years and years and years, maybe it will form, but uh, it's, it's, it's hard on the laboratory time scale. But by accelerating things through warming, if you warm up the ice just a bit, you can form, uh, at least we've seen two different hydrates of sulfuric acid, the monohydrate and the tetrahydrate. Mark Leffler was with us for eight years. He studied the destruction of these things, measured half-life of so the hydrates. These things won't go down. You take these hydrates and you irradiate them. You can start to destroy them. They're hard to destroy, but once you warm the sample back up, it, they come right back. These things just uh, won't go down easily. Okay, the thermal chemistry. These are thermodynamic equilibrium constants for water reacting with hydrogen sulfate, SO2, and CO2. And all you've got to know is this measures the tendency for this reaction to take place. The bigger number here means the reaction takes place easily. 
Uh, this is a strong acid. This thing goes over in a shot. Thermodynamically, this is, uh, you know, this is the, the ultimate. This is not a problem. Uh, the one down here at the bottom, H2OCO2, goes over to bicarbonate, and 10 to minus 7. This is what, 10 billion times, 10 billion, yeah, 10 to the 10th power, 10 billion times less favorable. But yet this happens. If this doesn't happen, we're all dead because we're exhaling CO2 right now. We'd all be poisoning each other. <laughs> but fortunately, this happens even though it's a low uh, thermodynamic uh, equilibrium constant. The CO2 dissolves in our bloodstream and keeps us all from dying when we have a meeting. In between is this thing this thing here. And so we looked at this thing here and we thought, you know, this, th we should be able to do this. If the human body does this and nature does this easily, we should be able to do this. And here we go. We're going the opposite direction. We're warming up this time from the bottom to the top. H2O, SO2. And the flat region right here is what I want to focus on. I think this sample is actually made at about 20K, but it doesn't really matter. You don't get into any action until you get about 50 or 60. You see a little bump here, bumpies here, bumps, 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 and you can identify these things as bisulfite. The bisulfite ion, and if you have enough, you can actually make this one over here, which is called metabisulfite. This is a thermal reaction. No radiation needed. All you need is some SO2 and some water. Thermal chemistry for the three chemists here, the reaction is a hydration. You get hydronium. This thing here can undergo three types of reactions. This one may be important. This one probably not important. This one I like. This one actually you have an SH band, 3.9 micrometers. And this one might be possible to uh, snoop around and search for. You may need a spectrometer that's a little bit closer to to uh, to uh, to Europa than uh, from the Earth's distance. You may need to go back and look for this again with uh, you know 21st century technology and so forth and so on, and lots of lessons learned from the past. Okay, solid phase chemistry, thermal chemistry can destroy SO2 in a water ice and make ions. So that after you go through this process, the SO2 is gone. You've got something else that's there. Well. Okay, what about the peroxide? If you know you have a thermal reaction involving SO2, the last step is to put the peroxide in, which is this. And I think this is the last of these sets of spectra I've got. And if you put H2O2 in here, the H2O2 actually chews up the, uh, the SO2 and you get sulfate that's formed. In the radiation, the Europa experiment, what happens is Europa makes the H2SO2, but you can simulate this, you can sort of cheat and add it in. And when you add it in yourself, you can actually watch the conversion over to, to uh, the sulfate. So warming of this thing here is the same thing as uh, irradiating this thing here. And the activation energy, which I learned this morning, is called EA. I never heard that expression, EA. Activation energy, 53 kJs per mole, 53 kilojoules per mole, which is uh, sort of a standard, you know, run-of-the-mill activation energy. Nothing, nothing very surprising about it. Uh, we sometimes talk about the, the hidden chemistry of Europa, and as several people said a few minutes ago, what we see is, is some upper layer with either UV or infrared or visible, and so we can see this part up here, you know, micrometers, but it's hard to see down into meters. I don't know if in any way you can see that without looking through fissures or going there and drilling or something or other. But uh, we know that there's chemistry taking place here because of what I just told you, that if you can get the SO2 and the H2O2 together with some water, you can have reaction chemistry taking place, and, and you'll never be able to see it without going there and drilling down. I know this doesn't sound very important to some of you, but if you are a sulfate-reducing bacterium, this is really important stuff. You know, this is like food, not food for thought food. We used to have these creatures, vulgar, I can understand that much Latin. We used to have these creatures in Florida, in, in the ground, the groundwater in Florida, and they would uh, chew up the sulfates in Florida in the groundwater, and every time we turned on the sprinkler system, we'd smell this ugly rotten egg stuff over here. I don't know if you have that in Houston or not, or in Texas. And so if you're uh, one of these organisms, and you know, I'm not saying that you can necessarily live on Europa, but it's not out of the realm of possibility that if you uh, have enough extremophile characteristics, you could survive there. And I've just shown you how you get your food. You wait for the peroxide. This depends on things going up and down. Still like to know that answer. How fast does it take to things go up and down? Right now, some of you are looking like you want to take that other pill and go back in the matrix. So, <laughs> so but hang on for another five minutes. Have I got five minutes? Yeah, nine. nine. The last part is to switch over from this inorganic chemistry and to switch it over to organic chemistry now. Because I wanted to say something, because there's very little about this. The, the talk this morning about amino acids and a few other little ones. 
But I, I want to say something about organic compounds, too. And I don't mean to cheese people off, but if, if you go to Europa and what you find is frozen salt water, you know, that might be hard to get your congressman excited, you know? And so you need that next extra little thing to spice it up a little bit more. You know, yeah, we're going to find frozen salt water, but it might have something to do with the you know, creation of the solar system or something. So I, I like to think about the organic molecules, too, not just the inorganic ones. So let's switch it over. Organics. Accretion from the solar nebula, you know, that subsurface ocean we like to talk about, you know, maybe there's organics sitting there right now, impacts, comets, certainly have, uh, you know, lots of organics, meteors have all sorts of things, uh, inter interplanetary, not interstellar, interplanetary dust particles, and radiolysis alters all of these things, you know, if, if you got organics present, from these sorts of uh, sources over here, the radiolysis that you have near the surface is going to change these things around, and you can get some very interesting organic chemistry. And so I'm just going to give you just a few examples. I don't know where I stole this. I stole it from somebody, maybe Bob Johnson or somebody. But uh, the surface is, uh, you know, 100K, you know, plus or minus 20 or 30. You know, the surface radiation comes down and hydrogen escapes. And so we think about there being oxidants, you know, oxidant-heavy surface. But, but those hydrogen atoms that go into forming H2, you know, those hydrogen atoms can also react with things that might be in the surface, like organic molecules. You can have radical reactions. These things are... What do we say? Hot, super thermal. The hydrogen atoms that you form from the radiolysis aren't just sitting there at 100 K. Here's three quick examples. I'm really only going to focus on the last one. First one up here, CO. You can reduce the triple bond down to a single bond. This is wood alcohol, carbon monoxide, automobile, exhaust, going down to wood alcohol. CO going down to methanol. Here's one acetylene. Acetylene goes down to ethane. You got the pattern? Triple bond goes to single bond. The last one, hydrogen cyanide. Hydrogen cyanide, these are radiations done at anywhere from 10 up to, uh, I guess the highest we've gone is maybe 100K. That's probably, I don't think we've gone above 100K. You know, 10 up to about, it gets hard to trap these things in water if you go too high. But, uh, you know, take the triple bond here, expose it to radiation and water ice, and you reduce it down to, to methylamine. Methylamine smells like dead fish. Maybe this is what Europa not tastes like, smells like. <laughs> smells like TV. But like that guy on TV says, wait, there's more. And the more is that, that one thing we know from, I don't know what, Carl Hibbets or somebody, we know that there's CO2 on Europa. And CO2 reacting with that thing right there, it's a well-known reaction to produce glycine. It's not that hard. You know, it's not that hard, Europa. You can make glycine just by taking, you know, cyanides, which we find, you know, one of the most common interstellar molecules. You find cyanides what, out the wazoo in Titan's atmosphere. You find also called nitriles, cyanides, nitriles, in comets. You know, it's just not that hard to find cyanides and nitriles in the solar system and beyond. So you take these things, you can form an amine, which is easily converted over into glycine, okay? So if you find glycine, you know, some of you younger people, if you find glycine on Europa in 40 years when I'm long gone, you know, yeah, it might be biology, but, you know, don't forget that it's a, a non-biological way to make it too, you know, so be, be careful. It's not just, uh, okay, well, you got the idea. Uh, one more, I think it's the last one. Cyanide can also be converted to cyanate, has the oxygen, the dif different uh, name there, OCN minus. It's very easy to convert this over. It's, uh, these two molecules have the same sort of structure called isoelectronic. And the conversion with radiation, this is a cyanide peak. It's going down with radiation into the cyanate that's coming up. And this is a nice one because it has a, has a feature. The feature is at 4.6 micrometers. It's, it's strong, but it's not quite as sharp as CO2, so it's a little harder to see. You'd like to go there, hang around Europa for a while, and actually see if you could find this thing, not just look from the Earth. I don't know if this is in the realm of possibility from the Earth or not, but uh, certainly be able to, if you could go there, you know, to look, uh, you know, we're only at 2,000 or so, that's not that far, you know, 4.6 micrometers. I've heard this within the last year. Someone said this might be a biomarker. That might be a marker of something that could, could uh, you know, a big biological molecule that you could break up and you could see this thing. And I, I think this is an abiological path that I would be very careful with. And I, I think this is a hard, it's a hard sell. Five minutes and I finally got into the new stuff. The new stuff, this is uh, perigericanus mostly. The last uh, few years, we've been switching away from some of the inorganic things that we've done with cyanates and sulfur and all these other things like this. And we've kind of gotten more into large molecules because we want to know how long these things will hang around on Europa. 
You know, and is there one particular type of, of organic molecule or a semi-biological molecule that might hang around longer than some others that you might actually go out and, and try to chase down? And we haven't measured many of these things. I think we've measured maybe three or four amino acids, and we've measured one nuclear base, and we've got a handful of organics. I think we've got acetone, you know, acetone, you know. This is uracil. It's a component of RNA. It's a uh, part of, uh, you find this in the Murchison meteorites. You can form this. This is uh, Dale Cruikshank's experiment. Dale Cruikshank, Chris Mattery, Scott Sanford. You can form this by UV photolysis, some of their so-called model isis, and yeah, it can indicate biological activity. You know, this is a chart straight from one of Chris's papers, and uh, just measures dose rate at different depths, if we read the paper correctly, and we try to measure half-life of this sort of molecule as judged by how fast it's destroyed in our experiments. Let me back up. We do an experiment. We measure how fast this thing is destroyed at different temperatures in a water ice, and then we can use the, uh, the conversion tables to, to get an estimate of about a million years. One of the products that you get out of this is just exactly the one I was telling you about a minute ago. So we're not really looking at products. We're looking at survival. How long will these things last? Yeah. One of the products is OC, that, that intersection there is C, OCN, which is what I was just talking about a minute ago. Yeah, so yeah, maybe OCN is a biomolecule marker or something like that, but, but OCN can be produced other ways too. Okay, OCN, seems like there was something else. Uh, I can't remember. Something about OCN I was going to tell you about here. Anyway, this is sort of the punchline, a million years, you know, a million, uh, eight, eight times 10 to 15th years for that. Okay, so I'm rapidly coming up on the end of my time, and Tracy's looking at me in a nervous way here, so I'll just say that, that uh, 20 years ago, people were wondering about what sorts of experiments, sorry, what sorts of reactions you could get in a water ice at low temperatures, at you know, 100K, much less 10K. But 100K on your rope, what, what sorts of chemical reactions can you track down? And there's evidence for all these sorts of reactions now. So there's a lot of work been, and particularly 30 years ago, 30 years ago, people are really doubting, would you really get, would you really get data from water ice? You know, water ice, boring old water ice. You know, if you take infrared spectroscopy, take an organic chemistry class in college, they'll tell you to keep the water away from the infrared spectrometer. Rule number one, no water with infrared. You know, it's exactly what we're doing. We're doing the wrong thing, in a sense, for, for the organic chemist. You know, but you get all these sorts of reactions. You know, hydrogen transfer, electron transfer, dimerizations, and all the other ones up here that I'm not going to tell you about. So there really is a rich chemistry. When people say there's a rich chemistry on Europa, you know, when there, when there could be a rich chemistry on Europa, they're not just pulling your leg. They're not just trying to sail you down the river. There are reactions that have been shown to take place at low temperatures, and with just a little, uh, you know, a little work, extra work, you could probably quantify these things. You can compare them to each other. You could set up competitions between them. Laboratory work, you can identify reactants, products, reaction pathways, predictions. Uh, you can reveal the invisible. You can find things that you can't. You can search for things that you might be able to find later. Let me put it that way, reveal the invisible. Stabilities, we've been looking at stabilities the last few years. Interpret, quantify, and guide. And so I guess the last thing is to say that, you know, to, to deep dive, to really deep dive into chemistry. In, in the chemical, you need to talk about chemicals at some point and talk about chemistry. And that means you need to uh, sort of put together some uh, system in which you can you know, relate these things here and gather data to, uh, to get a complete picture of what Europa chemistry is like. And it doesn't mean just the geology or just the, you know, the physics or just the chemistry, but you really need to combine some of these things, which is a nice thing about this workshop and, and its type. Uh, we do about one Europa paper a year over the last few years. You know, this is uh, mostly Mark Leffler and Perry Jerichinas working with me here, and mostly Marla Moore and myself working down here at the bottom. We work rain and shine, and sometimes in snowstorms. There's only one car there. That's my car there. I'm the one who took the picture. And don't don't read anything into this, although I will point it out. This is the administration building. You'll notice there's no cars in their parking lot. <laughs> no, they're great. They're, the God administration is very good. <laughs> Let me say that. And so I'll thank all these people. These are uh, great colleagues. These and some postdocs we've had and some undergraduates and, and, and the people who work on these missions have just been uh, terrific about sharing data and giving us ideas and, and telling us uh, things that have come along. And finally, any part of this presentation you want, you're free to take it. Thanks a lot. Thanks for your time. Hey, I was, I was interested in your um, uh, peroxide. So you asked the question, of course, yeah, I'm sorry. whether or not anyone ever figured out if 
the peroxide and the CO2 were in the same places, but of course, until until Sam's work that you just saw on Tuesday, yesterday, I guess, uh, nobody knew where the peroxide was. But so, so what she saw is that the peroxide is there um, in those same regions that have whatever that spectral thing is that we don't know what it is, that could be salt, could be something else. Is there anything besides the CO2 which would uh, make peroxide it more preferably? <laughs> okay. Laughing that's, at N2O would that's do That's a it. positive identification yeah, on Europa. That's not a positive identification on Europa. <laughs> Another one is oxygen. Oxygen itself would help out. Oxygen is a fairly good electron scavenger. And of course, oxygen would just uh, you know, add the hydrogen atoms onto it, and you, you can make pro so uh, O2. O2 would help. That's maybe, you know, what's the, what's the expression? Begging the question, assuming what you're trying to prove. Yeah. Yeah. So o O2. But CO2 is, uh, it seems like the most likely candidate. SO2, I'm not sure about. Maybe SO2. Yeah, Carl. No, Roger. Uh, OK, yeah. Um, maybe we've had this conversation, but most of the data you showed was five microns and longer. As chemists, I understand that, but it doesn't cover the range of the the Europa mission. So I think you said previously that you do cover that range. So in all these experiments, do you have data down to 0.1 microns? And could that be available? If, I mean, if I had it, I would give it to anybody who wants it. But uh, I don't think we have the radiation experiments out that far. I don't think we do. You know, we would love to do some out there, but the reason we use this region, we're not trying to generate data in these experiments to do comparisons directly. What we're trying to do is unravel the chemistry. And so the unraveling of the chemistry takes place in a different region. Right, but then, but, then uh, those experiments uh, need to be done again, or at least a uh, subset that's right. Ultimately, with measurements to, yeah. at shorter wavelengths that the spacecraft can see. Yeah, when you find something interesting, then you would go. But we're not, we will never, we put this down on record, we will never start by doing experiments in the near infrared or far infrared. We'll always start in the mid infrared because that's where you see the changes. And then once we identify the changes, then we'll move to the far infrared, near infrared or far infrared. But we'll always do the mid infrared first because that's where you identify change. Um, quick follow up on that, but it does go down to two and a half, right? Your spectrum. You just showed yes, five that's right. longer, so yeah, you could yeah, go we, to two and a half. I, I guess uh, and Roger, that's the what we really usually go to five thousand or so. Is about you know we we have done some beyond five thousand, yeah. but not very many. Exactly. Um, your experiment started with SO two, but on Europa, let's say we don't have SO two, we have sulfur. Um, does that affect the um, your equations at all and the processes if you have to so. create I, I, SO two from S implantation in water. Yeah, I think the the S once it's in the water, it's going to create H two S, and we have done the H two S experiments. The H two S goes right over to SO two. Okay. And so, okay, and then one final comment: CO two has been detected in the non ice material on Europa. Okay. There's some, something else I want to say about the, the sulfur there. I don't know how much time she's going to give me here, but but the, uh, the there have been some experiments where there's been an implantation of sulfur into to water. And they have a hard time seeing SO2. And I think the reason is that radiation track I showed you up there, you've got one you know, stinking S that goes into the ice, and that S creates this long track of peroxides. And so this one S is sitting there, and it could make SO2, but it's more likely that, that S is going to create SO2, which is going to go immediately over to sulfate, because it's surrounded by all this oxidizing material. Yeah. So it's very hard, actually, to put S in the ice and make the SO2 directly. You know? I don't know how secure that identification is now, the SO2. I don't, I don't think it ever was that secure. They see a band at four microns, which could be the... It's the, what is it, the Lonnie Lane, and uh, what's the other one? Amanda Hendricks, I guess, is the... the yeah, I don't think SO is so. a firm identification. Yeah, there's, there's, no, there's nothing at four microns. It's, uh, there's, there's no SO2 at that point. It's on Yes, there is. Yes, it's a paper by Hanson with four. Uh, SO2 on CO2. Yes, I agree with that first statement, but there is nothing on your that. <laughs> <laughs> the high resolution is, you know, you can see that. It's the wrong wavelength for SO2. I agree with that. That's what I'm saying. There's a man of four microns, but identifying it as SO2 is a difficult Yes. So you. <laughs> You described this composition, uh, competition of radiation-driven and thermal chemistry, whether it's making SO2 or, or what. Um, so would I be correct to think that the sulfate would show a temperature dependence? Maybe you would see more of it at low latitudes, for example? 
I, I don't know if we've ever measured the yield so accurately I could answer that, but my gut reaction is based on a lot of years doing it, is there wouldn't be much difference. You know, I think once you get the radiation involved, the, the temperature, you know, for sulfate formation is just not going to change very much. The yield, not going to change the yield very much. That's that's you know, I mean, we could we could bet a pizza or something like that, but but that's my my guess. It is a guess. Right. Mm, one last question up there. Yeah, Reggie, I'm just going to be a little nitpicky. Did you say? Did I hear you say correctly that you didn't detect peroxide with your experiments from pure water ice? That's, that's exactly right. We did the experiment at 100K with the proton beam, and we don't see the peroxide. And this was just like stunning. How oh. could this possibly be? Well, we saw it, right? I, mean, saw, well, I thought you saw it with something, a different type of ion, though, I thought. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a, your, your ions were much energetic, I think. You were yeah. about I, I'm sorry. You saw it with different energy ion. That's what it was. That's right. Different, different, that's right. Okay, like that's, 100 that's, KV that's, versus... That's, that's wrong, too. You saw it with a different stopping power ion. That's, that's what, right. That's right. High, higher stopping power. Yeah. High stopping. yeah. Well, Great. Okay. I mean, uh, do you make it or not make it with the ions that are coming in at Europa? I mean, he says he sees the peroxide. You say you don't. Yeah, you, it depends and, on the stopping and power. We know what the ions coming in are. I mean, what's the issue? Yeah, I mean, the, the flux goes up, right, at low energy. So we should see it. I mean. If you have the lower in, if you have the lower energy but higher stopping power ion, you can start to see it. If you have the lower, so it depends you, on how many how many of these. So you don't need CO two. You don't know unless you unless you want to try to make it with the slightly higher energy ions. And, 